in geometry. That's in this uh, yellow book that came out uh, during the pandemic. Um, so I'll give you some background on that. And then I will show you where Yang-Baxter equations resurface. So Yang-Baxter equations obviously have a long history. Thomas mentioned integrable systems. For me, they're really coming out of quantum groups, intimately tied with quantum groups, and we will see that in the early parts of the talk. But I want to show at the end that actually they're still very current and are arising in all sorts of other places that you wouldn't expect. And this is how I'll end with some current work. Okay, so if you are attending because of the workshop starting tomorrow, then we're interested in what constructions specialize to interesting ones on sets. But that isn't going to be just the focus today. Now, um, why doesn't okay so firstly a little bit of background uh, i promised to go very i promised tomas to go very slowly so a braided category um most of you will know this it's just a collection of objects so c is going to be a collection of objects with a functor called the tensor product from c cross t c to c and then two natural isomorphisms one is between tensor around the opposite and the other is between comp two different compositions of tensor so this one is called the associator and this is called the braiding. And associated to this, there's a theorem of, of McLean, which says that, so if you just have, if you just have phi and don't have the braiding, then that's a, a monoidal category. And McLean explained that actually you don't have to worry about phi or the brackets. You can just pretend that the thing is strictly associative and always insert brackets afterwards. So that's what we'll do. Um, and then for the braiding psi, McLean actually proved the coherence theorem for symmetric categories, which was it immediately generalizes, and that was noted by Joel and Street to the braided case. Um, and that's his diagrammatic, and that's proven using a diagrammatic notation, in which we'll read our maps going downwards. And so, so this is a natural transformation. So for every v and w, it assigns a map from v tensor w to w tensor v, and we'll represent that map like this going down the page by a braid crossing. And the inverse, like that, is also a map. Um, this particular inverse, uh, and we'll denote it with the opposite braid crossing. And then the coherence theorem then says is that if you have a composition of phi's and, and psi's, which represent the same braid, um, then they correspond to the same composite. Um, <clears throat> now, the, deta the detailed definitions, we don't need to go into it very formally because this is quite well known now, but the main identity for, that, for psi is the hexagon identity, which says that if you think of V tensor W as one object, and braid it past z. So this is psi v tensor w comma z. And that should be the same as first braiding w past z and then braiding v past this z here. And then <clears throat> similarly on the other side. Now these two together imply the braid relations, which I didn't draw explicitly, but um, they're just the relations obeyed by, by th three braid crossings, v, w, and z. I'll, I'll show them at some point in the talk. Um, now the Functoria, because it's a natural transformations, it means that any morphism can be pulled through. So if you if you have a morphism from V to, from V to Z and then apply the braiding, it's the same as applying the braiding with 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 V and then applying the morphism. There's also duals, which we won't need to, uh, very much today. So that's the kind of context we're working with in a modern setting. Now, one of the first theorems about this, which is, has turned out to be quite important is this a, a, a construction which is typically called the, the Drinfeld center, but actually it was introduced in my paper uh, in a more general form. And I call, I want to show you my point of view on this, which is a little bit different, which is that it's really a kind of duality. I was very interested in duality and um, Fourier transforms. So if you have a monoidal category C and another one V with a functor between them, we don't need the braiding for this. Um, then there's a dual category which I call C circle with, again with a functor. So this is like a, a base it's over V. And the special case when V is equal to C and F is just the identity. So the only data is just a monoidal category. Uh, that's, that's, that's called the center Z of C. And um, the general construction and, and, and uh, um, appeared in, in my paper here. And uh, the history of that is, is that when my preprint came out in 1990, Rinfeld wrote me a letter saying he was aware of the special case. And so I cited that letter and so it's called the Grinfeld center. Now the um, objects uh, are pairs v and lambda v, lambda or lambda v associated to v where lambda v is a natural transformation between v tensor f and f tensor v. So v tensor f is a functor from c to v and so is f tensor v 
and lambda is natural transformation between them, in fact, natural isomorphism. So that means that for every x, there's these maps. And the condition which we ask is that if you apply lab lambda first, you see it swaps the order, and then you apply lambda again on y, then it's the same as applying um, x tensor lambda on x tensor y. And the way I think of that is that what you're doing is you're, and these c's are the natural isomorphism between f of x tensor f of y and f of x, well, let's just say c converts between f of brackets x tensor y and f of x tensor f of y. So that's just a little bit of bookkeeping that comes with a monodal functor f. Um, but basically, forgetting about c, basically it just says is that lambda is represent that the tensor product of the category, so x tensor y, is represented as a composition, one of x and another of with y. So, it, so I think of this as a representation of, of the category C with its tensor product. And that's why those collection objects I called them the dual. But, this, but the case of particular interest, it turns out, um, is, is the case when f is the identity, because in that case, your lambdas, they go from two copies of the same category. They're both in C or V. Um, and then you can just have, a, then you can just regard um, that as itself a braiding. So that makes the category braided. So what this tells is a very powerful theorem. It tells you that any modal category, and of course there are zillions of modal categories, you can come up with them, you know, all over the place, uh, has a braided um, category uh, generated from it, which is the center. So for example, if you take the category of G modules where G is a, a group, then Whitehead, in fact, in the algebraic topology, constructed a notion of G-crossed G, G modules. And uh, so he discovered that without knowing, of course, about braided categories. But they are, in fact, that, in fact, uh, is what you get if you take the center of the category of G modules. So the objects are, um, are objects of the uh, are G modules, because that's the underlying category, that's V here, um, with further structure, which is contained in lambda. And that further structure is a G grading. So they're G graded G modules. Um, and the, the two are compatible. Namely, if you act on something of degree G, then it lands in something of degree H G H inverse. And then the braiding described here, that just comes out as this, that if you want to braid V in with one degree, let's say V is in something of degree, which I call mod V, um, and you want to braid it past W, then you swap them, but as it goes past, it acts on it um, by, the, by the action. So because, because V and W are elements of G-graded G modules. So this is the braiding in the category. Now, so it's gonna move this bar out of the way. Um, now, um, an important example is of course, a conjugacy class sitting inside a group. Um, and so, because there, you have the grading by the actual element of C uh, as an element of the group. So it has a, has a self grading by itself and the group acts by conjugation. So that preserves C. So, so the vector space spanned by C is itself a, a G graded G module. And then the braiding on it uh, is the, from this formula. In fact, you can see it is just this. Now, of course, this is in the linearized setting, uh, but you don't have to do it in a linearized setting. You can just take a, this in a set theoretic setting and just regard this as a, as a formula, as, as a set theoretic braiding. So this is the first example of how set theoretic braidings arise naturally and, um, from a conjugacy class, actually a quandal, as we'll see, um, sitting inside a, a finite group, or in fact, well, actually any group. Now, the, uh, of course, you don't have, you're not limited to groups uh, or sets. So I want to show you a bit of the wider background. So if you take this construction and you apply it to a Hopf algebra, so I'm sure everybody knows what a Hopf algebra is uh, at this point, but I'll just say it in one line. So it's an algebra over a field with a product and a unit and a co-algebra. So that means maps going the opposite way with a co-product and a co-unit. And the two are compatible. For example, you can ask, you can say it different ways, but one way to say it is that, that, that delta and epsilon are algebra maps. And in addition, that's a bi-algebra. In addition, there should be an antipode. I won't spell out what the axioms are. I'll show you them in a minute in a more general way. Um, but this is the kind of linearized inverse. And these quantum groups, of course, hit the scene. And uh, well, they were known, the axioms were known since in the 1940s, but they really arrived en masse, if you like, in the, in the 80s. 
uh, coming out of examples coming out of integrable systems. Now, uh, the center of uh, of it's actually what Grimpel wrote to me in his letter that the center of of H modules um, is is D of H modules. Uh, where D is a certain Hopf algebra, which is the Drinfeld double. Now, Drinfeld, so associated with every Hopf algebra with this is double Hopf algebra whose category of modules is braided. Now, that's actually strictly true in the finite dimensional case. Drinfeld defined it in the finite dimensional case, but it works more generally if you take this as a definition. And you can replace this category by what you get if H is finite infinite dimensional, then that you just replace this by an appropriate category, which is a category of Getter Drinfeld modules, or I call them cross modules in honor of Whitehead. And um, and the actual structure of D of H, well, the way I did it in, in my 1990 uh, paper was that I built it on the tensor product. So it's not quite the way Trimple did it, explicitly on the tensor product uh, of H star and H. And it contains H star opposite and H as sub-algebras, sub hop algebras, and, and this kind of a hop algebra that factorizes into those two. And the cross relations are given like this. They're a bit complicated. Um, now, part of this, is, uh, and the notation here is, is that the ones and twos refer to the co-product. So if I apply the co-product to H, then delta of H is H1 tensor H2 summed over such terms. That's a very compact notation. And the pairing here, the angular brackets is the pairing between H star and H, the evaluation map. Now, what's pretty important is, uh, is, is what generates the braiding here. And that can be attributed in Drinfeld's theory to this element here. This is an element of D of H tensor D of H. This part lives in D of H, this part lives in D of H, where EA is a basis of H and FA is a dual basis. And more generally, um, Drinfeld had this notion of a quasi-triangular Hopf algebra. So that means a Hopf algebra with an element R of H tensor H, of which D of H is an example. Um, but you could have any other Hopf algebra with this structure. And then it ensures that the, using this R, it ensures that the category is braided. Uh, one of the first important results here is that this category of modules in this case, if H is quasi triangular, then the category of modules embeds in the category of cross modules or Drinfeld uh, double modules, um, which tells you another way to say that is to say that every quasi triangular value is a quotient of the double. So the double really is the master thing which uh, underlying uh, most quantum group constructions in, in some sense. Now, the um, the other uh, thing is you might say, well, this is too complicated. Ooh, what happened there? Sorry, I need to cancel that. Uh, where am I? I should, I, um, okay, sorry about that. I, I, I'll just turn off my phone so that I don't, I hopefully won't get called again. Um, So uh, where was I? So yeah, you might say, well, um, you might say, actually, I don't want to have a, this complicated structure. I'd like to have a semi-direct product. So I'd like to just have an action of H on something and we'll make a smash product or cross product algebra, and maybe something similar for the car algebra. And that can be done, but uh, you have to change, replace H star um, by it, uh, uh, change its product to a certain other, other thing, which is it's called its transmutation. So there's a whole theory behind that, which I will come to shortly. And so you can replace the H star by, by the braided group version of it, which is a hot algebra braided category. And then you have a, a, a nicer structure for D of H. Now, I just want to say before I move on uh, that there's a whole load of unresolved problems from the, from the 90s, uh, which are still unresolved. So for example, Lustig showed that all the standard Q deformations, UQG, have what's called the Lustig kernel, which is a reduced version of the, of the quantum group um, at, when Q is the root of unity. So if Q is an S root of unity, you can add the relations like e to the n uh, is zero and f to n is zero where e and f are the root vector generators. Um, but, uh, and that's fine for the hot algebra, but this thing didn't study the quantum triangular structures. And it's quite a non-trivial problem. So if you build up these things by a certain structure, which I'm not gonna talk about today called double bosonization, then you can see explicitly how to do it and remain in the, cate in the category of quantum triangular hot algebra. So you can do it, but you need certain data and that data involves number theory. So I'd say it's not at all, um, and we, we, did, we did a certain amount in this paper, but I'd say that this is really quite an interesting problem that has not really been touched by, by pure mathematicians even to date. Okay, um, as to the quantity triangular structures and classification of them. Um, now, the returning to the double, 
the actual structure of the quantum double is really a double cross product. It's a half algebra that factorizes into H1 and H2. Here, one is H and the other was H, H star opposite. But it's a more general concept. And what you can show from such a factorization is that each Hopf algebra acts on the vector space, in fact, on the co-algebra of the other with certain matching conditions. And then there's a process, certainly if H is fine, if, if, uh, if let's say in the five dimensional case, then an action, a, a, left, um, a right action on H1 of H1 on H2 in dualizes to a left action of H1 on H2 star. And similarly, the, co uh, the action the other way can be viewed as a co-action of H2 star. So you can build a new object where you dualize one of the factors, I call it semi-dualization. And this gives you a new Hopf algebra, completely different from the double or from the double original one you began with. And so this was a different class of, of, of Hopf algebras uh, introduced in, in the 80s um, uh, by this by cross product construction. And but they 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 have their matching data. They're different hot boundaries, but they have isomorphic. They have equivalent data in the finite dimensional case. And so, uh, for example, um, if you take X to be a finite group that factorizes into two subgroups, G and M, um, uniquely, uh, then from this factorization, you can take things in the wrong order. So S is in M and U is in in G take them in the wrong order and reorder them using the unique factorization. And that will define these two actions. So in that way, G acts on M and M acts on G. And they will form a, a matched pair of actions. And what that means is, is best written in this diagrammatic manner. So um, I'm going to label the, the edges of the plaquette here by elements of M and elements of, of G. And I'm gonna fill in the other two corners by the action. So if I, if, if I have S and U here, then how S, as U goes upwards, gets acted upon by S. And as S goes to the right, it gets acted upon by U. So that's my diagrammatic representation of the action. And then this property says, the, the matching conditions, which are deduced from the factorization, says that um, if you um, label the edge, if you take two of these plaquettes and glue them together along an edge where they match, then that's the same as taking the whole plaquette. So it's a kind of surface stoxis theorem kind of condition. Um, and so literally what it says is, is that ST acting on U is the same as ST. Um, so it says that ST acting on U followed by S acting on that, which is S acting on T acting on U is the same as ST acting on U. Uh, but the other way around is a bit less obvious. This says that um, U acting on ST here, uh, is the same as uh, T acted upon by U and then S acted upon by U, but before it gets acted upon by U, T acts on U. So these are some of the funny conditions, but they have this geometrical interpretation. Now, um, the, from that same data by semi-dualization, you will get an old, a, a new Hopf algebra, which will be different from this, the one of the group algebra of X. And that would be, um, this by cross product Hopf algebra, where G acts on M, so you get this semi-direct product, um, and vice versa, M uh, acts on G, but they can view that as a co-action of K of M. And what it boils down to is a new a new product. So when you and you can take the same basis, so you can take these elements as a as a set natural natural basis with positive structure constants, very natural thing, um, and the product is zero unless they line up in which case they are the merged plaquette. And the co-product is all the splittings of the plaquette into two smaller plaquettes in such a way that they line up. So really, once you know this, this picture, then this is all geometric. Now, the Hopf algebra itself was known, uh, this special case of the, by cross product was known earlier in the work of Takuchi, although he didn't do it this way. Now, the question we're going to ask, the first question we might ask, and I'd say this because a lot of people don't know this. So, I thought I would mention it. I was talking to some experts uh, who, who weren't, um, um, didn't, oh, I had the impression this wasn't a well-known result. So if you, you might say, well, I've got this new Hopf algebra, let's take its double and get a braided, this is not necessarily braided, it's not necessarily quasi-triangular, although you can look at the quasi-triangular structures on it, um, but you can ask, you can get one by taking its double. So let's take its double and then we'll get a braided category. So out of every factorization, we will get a braided category. And we'll certainly get set theoretic examples because you have these nice bases where everything is just has positive, has just has um, uh, very simple structure constants. Uh, so the, um, 
but in fact is a theorem uh, proven at the time when I was in Swansea that Amash was referring to, but it didn't come out for some years later, but um, it was done in 89, but um, that, the, that the double of this by cross product actually is, it is a new Hopf algebra, but it's twisting equivalent to the group out to, to the double of just the group algebra of X. So what you get, and, and so the modules of this guy are just the X cross modules. So the category here is a category of X cross modules, the ones I just told you about, the whitehead ones, where the group is now X. But this category being twisting, this being twisting equivalent in the sense of a Drunfeld twist is just, I'm not gonna tell you the details, it just means that the categories are equivalent as monoidal, as braided monoidal categories. So this, so the new category you get is actually equivalent to this, to this standard one. Now, of course, there's a lot of work that's been done since, since that time. The most important paper, I guess, is Lu, Lu Yan and Zhu, uh, 2000, which was about the quasi-triangular structures on this. And, and, uh, and then it was much later work, which I'm sure uh, Le Leandro is going to talk about. So I won't say too much about this by Agata and Leandro uh, relating to set theoretic solutions and braces. So um, that's just, so this just gives you a flavor of how quantum, how braided categories arise from quantum groups. So now uh, that is really the first bit of my talk. Now I want to move on to sort of some more fun, exciting stuff the way I see it with braided geometry rather than kind of historical origins. So we're going to look specifically at Hopf algebras in braided categories. I, I did call them braided groups and I admit this term did not catch on, um, but the idea was they're like quantum groups, but they're in a braided category. Um, but anyway, the definition is just that you're in a braided category, you have an object, um, which I'm not, I haven't even labeled it, let's call it B. Um, it's a single object and you have a braiding on it as part of the braided category. We'd actually need the whole category, we just need to have the object and, and, a, and a solution of the, of the young batch equations on it um, and on its products. Um, so anyway, let's, let's suppose we are in a braided category. So an object in the category of a product, um, which I'm going to write again going downwards. So the, the B tends to B into B is the product. Could be a unit, which is the trivial object of the category into B, and the co-product is going to be from B into B tends to B, and the co-unit from B into the trivial object. Um, they are being I've adopted computer scientist notation for this, so if you'll forgive me. Um, so th th I'll just go to this one. This one just says that the co-product of one is one tends to one, and this says that epsilon of a product is the same as epsilon of the two things separately. The, the most important one here is the, the bi-algebra axiom. So they said if you take a product and then you take a co-product, it's the same as taking the product, the co-products first and then braiding past and then making the product. So this guy here, including the braiding is the tensor product algebra structure. So this says that delta is a algebra home from B into B tensor B, but for the tensor product braided tensor product algebra. And this is the antipode I promised. So B, uh, if you apply, take the co-product, apply the antipode and then apply the product, you get something trivial on either side. That's the same as for ordinary Hopf algebras. And now what's amazing is, is that this theory works and does not get tangled up. It's far from obvious, okay? I know young people take this all for granted now, but in the day it wasn't obvious that, that this would work. So for example, I'm going to show you the proof of this lemma here, that if you take the product of, and, you, and then you apply S to it, S is like an inverse, then it's the same as applying S to each factor, then applying the braiding and then taking the products. It's what you would expect from an algebra home. And the proof is like this. Um, firstly, we start off with this quantity. Now we graphed on this guy here. This guy is an antipodal loop. So this actually is trivial. That is the same as this. And applying the co-unit uh, doesn't do anything. I'm sure, not sure I listed that explicitly, but because it's the co-unit, applying the co product and the co-unit just makes the identity map along here. So this doesn't do anything. Um, then I drag this over to the other side. And then I reorganize using associativity. So this, pro well, over here, this co-product and this co I can put this branch on the other side. That's co-associativity. So that's on, now on the other side. And then I um, can recognize here the bi-algebra axiom, this guy here. So I can replace this by that. And I recognize an antipodal loop, so I can cancel it. And I just get this. And I can turn the whole proof upside down. And then you'll get the proof of the other half that it's also a car algebra anti-homomorphism. Now, one thing I would point out for with regard to the workshop tomorrow is that this whole thing, although it typically would work in an abelian category, it doesn't have to be abelian. It just the organism monoidal category. You don't have to have addition. So, for example, you could have a set. B could be a set with a braiding, uh, a braided set, 
And then this notion of a hot fat of a braided group structure on it really would be more like a group um, and not, not and less like an algebra. Um, but this, these axioms would make sense and this theorem would make sense. Um, so, you, and you, so you really have a kind of group theory. And let me just say one more thing. Um, if you were doing, let's, let's just take, if you, if you actually had a group here, if G was an actual group, then, and the coproduct would just be the diagonal on that. So G gets split into G tends to G. S is just inverse. This just becomes G inverse G should be something trivial, should be one. So these axioms, they really just generalize group theory. So what's happening here is, is that group theory can be done at the level of, of diagrams. Uh, and that, uh, you know, it's not so much about hot algebra, it's really about group ideas. In particular, we're going to look at adjoint actions. So this is by conjugation. So doing what I just said, there's a little tip missing here, got rubbed out. Um, the, uh, if I take G and H here, I split G into two, I apply inverse, so that becomes G, G inverse H. Then I take it past, in, in, for an ordinary group it would be trivial taking it past. And so then I would end up with H, G, H inverse, and that would be conjugation. So this would be the adjoint action, but the adjoint action in a group just becomes this diagram. And if I apply this diagram and then I apply it again, so that's the adjoint action, adjoint action, then this proof, I won't read it out, but similar to what I did just now, ends up by showing it's the same thing as multiplying in the, in the group in, in the first, in the braided group first or the Hopf algebra first, and then applying the adjoint action. So it's truly an action. So every braided Hopf algebra acts on itself by the adjoint action. Um, moreover, this adjoint action respects the products. It's like an algebra automorphism, and that's what I'm showing here that if I apply the product and then I apply the adjoint action, it's the same thing as applying the adjoint action to two parts. First, I have to split G into two parts. So then G here and G here, and then this G acts on, on H and this G acts on H prime. And that, then multiplying them is the same as multiplying H and H prime first and then applying the adjoint action. So it acts by group automorphisms. So these properties you would expect for the adjoint action. Now there's a lot more that you wouldn't necessarily think about, but actually they also hold for groups as well as for, braided Hopf algebras or ordinary Hopf algebras. And so I'm going to, so that I'm going to, not going to list, I'm not going to show you any proofs of them, but look at this kind of calculation established many other properties of add. And I've listed them here as the axioms of a bradedly algebra. So everything I'm saying here is true. If you take L to be B itself and take this angular, the square bracket here to be add, then these are all true statements. Well, this, this one and this one are true statements. This is a true statement for the adjoint action for a certain for certain braided Hopf algebras. It, it expresses the kind of co-commutativity. For example, delta G is G tends to G. That's obviously co-commutative. So there's a large class of braided Hopf algebras for which this is also true. And in particular, um, starting with a braided category, just by itself, you can do a generalized tanaka crime reconstruction and reconstruct an ordinary Hopf algebra underlying it. You have to have certain assumptions. Um, and that those braided Hopf algebras arising at automorphisms of braided categories, they automatically, they live in the category itself and they automatically obey this condition. So that, so this existence is established. There are plenty of these examples. And in particular, all the ones I mentioned that come from transmutation, those examples be that I mentioned to do with the double, they all obey this axiom as well. So these are three properties which uh, are true for a large class of braided Hopf algebras. And I just restrict them to a, a subset for which, for which they remain true. And I call that a braided Lie algebra. I mean, I guess it could be true that this is true for a subset and not true for the whole thing. So this way, this is the definition. Now it turns out there's a whole load of theory associated with this. You can define an enveloping algebra. Okay, in the paper, it was done in an abelian case with a tensor, tensor algebra with some relations, but actually if you're smart about it, you can do it more generally. Uh, I'll show you how that works uh, for sets. Um, the, uh, then you have a, a notion of representations of a braided Lie algebra. For example, the adjoint action itself. So L will always act on itself by the bracket. Um, there's a notion of a killing form, meaning you apply, apply this and apply it again in a rigid braided category. So you would need that duality I mentioned, uh, which I didn't really go through, but um, then take a trace. Then you have a killing form. There's a notion of cohomology, which was studied by Wamst. Um, so there's quite a lot there. Uh, now, of course, we want to know the burning question, which you all have on your mind is, this looks nothing like a Lie algebra. So in what way is that a Lie algebra, okay? So that's the first question I just want to answer for you. So that's the example in the upper part of this slide. So G is a category of vector spaces. So the braiding is just a trivial flip. And I'm going to look at braided Lie algebras of the following form. 
G, an ordinary vector space, plus a one-dimensional vector space with a basis C, uh, with a certain form of coproduct. And the coproduct would be group-like on C and primitive C primitive on X, on X in G. So on G, it looks like this. Uh, and on, on the one-dimensional basis C, it looks like this. And then the bracket has a certain bracket which is closed in G. So I'll just suppose that the bracket has this form. Um, and C acting is going to act as the identity. And X acting on C is going to be 0. And epsilon of C, X is 0, and epsilon of C is 1. Now, if you stick, all of, if you stick these assumptions, this, this kind of example, or ansatz, if you like, into the, into the first identity, this, this pentagonal Jacobi identity, this is what you get. So writing the coproduct X as two terms, the yellow bit and the green bit, I've got two terms. I have X here. Del here is delta X. I write that as two parts. Firstly, the green part, and then we add to it. Firstly, the green part, and then we add to it the red part. So then the green part, we have C tensor X. So X goes past and acts on Z. And C goes over here. C acts on Y. So that just gives you Y. And then Y acts on, on, on the result of this. So you just get Y acting on X tensor Z. That agreed? Now, and the other term was X tensor C. So here C goes right past and C acts on Z just gives me Z. And over here, I just have X. X acts on Y gives me X bracket Y. And now I've got X bracket Y here and I've got Z here. So I got X bracket Y acts on Z. So I see I've got two terms. On the other side, I've just got Y acting on Z and then X acting on Y acting on Z. So this equality is just the usual Jacobi identity. So we recover the usual Jacobi identity um, you, we recover, basically recover ordinary Lie algebras in this case. Of course, ordinary Lie algebras have an extra assumption that the bracket is anti-symmetric, which we haven't assumed. So it's slightly more general, it's a Leibniz algebra. Um, and then I mentioned this universal enveloping algebra of a braided Lie algebra. I should have mentioned that U of L is a bi-algebra in the braided category. So here it will be an ordinary bi-algebra. And what it is, is is a quadratic version of the, of the enveloping algebra. It's a vector space, it's the tensor algebra on C, plus G plus C, or if you like, the vector, vector uh, the tensor algebra on G adjoin C, but with this relation. And now if you set C to one, then you've just got usual enveloping algebra. So this is our bi-algebra, which projects onto the usual enveloping algebra. Now, if you do the same construction, and of course there's many other things in this category, even with C equals a vect, you've got a lot more than ordinary Lie algebras, but you've still got a lot of Lie theory in there. And an example which goes beyond the Lie algebra would be a linearization of the, of the, of the next one. So the next one is C to be category of sets. Again, the braiding is just trivial. And I take, so C, L is just gonna be some object, which I'm calling C, um, some, some set. And the elements of the set are going to be all diagonal, have diagonal co-product. And then I'm gonna denote the, denote the bracket. I'm gonna denote it as A acting, look at, denote it like that. And then what does the axiom say? It says that if I act with B and then I act with A, that should be the same as first diagonally splitting or Xeroxing A, so I've got A twice, then this A acts on here, this A acts on B, and then the result of this acts on the result of that. So that you will recognize, many of you will recognize, is the axiom of a quandle. So a quandle is nothing other than a braided Lie algebra in the category of sets. Now, if you, um, if you linearize it, uh, then you can certainly write down a bi-algebra, and that bi-algebra will be essentially will be the group algebra, the bio, the group, the, the monoid, the algebra generated by the monoid with these relations. Um, I don't want to dwell on that too much because we're interested really in the, in the set theoretic sense, but you can stay in the set theoretic category. The version of that in the set theoretic case is just to do the same construction, but do it in the category of sets. So, and, and the particular case of interest is when C is closed under a certain operation, which I'm going to call inverses. So not every quandle has that property, but suppose that there is a map which we call inverse on the set C, which has the properties you would expect to be the inverse of the operation. Uh, we call that an IP quandle in this, in this paper. Um, and we'll also suppose that C is in, in so then from that data, you can build a, a group um, by just taking these monoid relations and also adding these relations then we'll get the group associated to the, to the IP quandle. Um, and then this U of L in the linearized case would just, would just map onto the group algebra of, of, of GC. Um, and of particular interest is the case where C actually is contained in there. It's kind of regularity assumption. 
the most important example is to just give me a finite group. Give me your favorite finite group and give me your favorite add closed subset, which is also closed under inversion. So a conjugacy class, for example, closed under inversion. Um, then we can regard that as a, as a that gives you, a, we can regard that as a, as a Lie algebra in the category of sets or as a quandle, that's well known, or we can take it linearly as a, as a vector space Lie, graded Lie algebra um, of the finite group G. And this, this, this group here will be a group you generate from the Lie algebra. So this is very similar to the idea that if you start with a Lie group and you take the Lie algebra and then you take the, the simple, the, the, the associated um, uh, simple uh, Lie group, um, sorry, the, the associated group with uh, pi one trivial um, of, uh, of the Lie algebra, that would be a covering group. So the same thing, same thing happens here. And you can prove results about the cohomology it's also in this paper. So, but there are many other, many other conjectures about this. For example, I mentioned the killing form. So on C, you will inherit a, qu a quantum killing form coming from the braided or braided killing form coming from the braided Lie algebra point of view. And asking when this braided Lie, this killing form is semi-simple is quite intimately tied with the group itself being finite. We've got some very interesting conjectures, some of which we proved in this paper. There's a lot more. The referee of this paper was a group theorist and suggested some further conjectures. If anyone's interested, I'm happy to pass those on. I haven't come back to this topic recently. But um, so there's a, there's a lot to be done there. Now, <clears throat> I just take a little pause here. Um, I, um, I just want to say, so I want to say that obviously I focused on, um, so the way I the way I see it, but there's a lot of a lot of opportunities here in the category. So these are like the, these. I focus on these simple examples, but I want to stress that these are just like the starting point. So you could let x. You could look for. Um, you could you could take x to be a, a a set, l to be a set with a young Baxter operator with the braiding on it, and then um, and even in the set theory, it doesn't have to be linearized. And you could ask for a Lie algebra of a of a of a, li, li, of a braided a braided quandle. It would be something obeying these axioms, but now the braiding here would be non-trivial. You put in the braiding that you have from your set theoretic solution of the young baxter equations. And then you'd be looking for something which is not an ordinary quandle, but, a, but something more general. So in this notion of a braided Lie algebra, you've got a large number of ways to generalize it. And this is like, to me, to my mind, the most obvious thing to look at. And I'm telling you, there's a good amount of machinery, there's cohomology, there's killing forms, et cetera, that you can then immediately apply to your theory. So I think that would be a really nice project if somebody wants to, to look at that. Uh, I, I, had, I should mention a couple of other things. Um, when, I, um, when I did it over here, I'm not sure I mentioned this properly, but um, oh, I think I did mention that. Okay, so I, I, I am sure Leandro will say a lot more. There are many other solutions of set theoretic solutions coming out of factorizations discovered by these, by these, by Agata and Leandro. Okay, I think I will just move on now. Um, uh, if there are any questions at this stage, I'm happy to take them. Otherwise, I'll move on to the third topic. Okay, so the third topic, I've set a good amount of time for this because this will be most unfamiliar to most people. What I've done so far is somewhat algebraic and many of you who work on in this area will be somewhat familiar with, with, with this stuff. The last one I'm, I'm assuming is less familiar. So um, this is really relates to non-commutative geometry. And the idea is that um, we start off with a classical manifold. Um, and the most important aspect of the manifold structure of it being a manifold is that we have an algebra of exterior algebra of differential forms. Um, we, have, we have one forms, omega one, contained in a larger algebra of exterior forms of different degrees. Now, omega one is things like this, df or things, well, dx spanned by dx in the local coordinate chart. Uh, and there's a map d from functions from c infinity of m into omega one. So we can regard c infinity as the degree zero part. There's omega one, omega two for the one forms, two forms, et cetera. Now, if you, of course, classically, they would commute. The differentials commute with functions. There's also a wedge product which from of one forms of, of, of forms of different degrees, which adds their degree. And D extends from here, which is from zero to one, extends from all degrees, increasing degree by one, obeying the graded Leibniz rule. And of course, classically, the exterior algebra is graded commutative. 
So um, that's the standard situation. Now, what we do in non-computer geometry, I mean, there, I should say there are many approaches on computer geometry. The one I'm going to be talking about is a kind of algebraic version, not the version which is more familiar if you follow Alan Kahn and people coming out of operator algebras. So there's a lot of overlap. And in particular, uh, they also use the notion of, of differential graded algebra. Um, but we don't, we can do everything algebraically over a field. We're not doing everything with analysis. Um, so what we do is we keep the algebra, let the algebra be possibly non-commutative. We drop the commutativity and the graded commutativity of the exterior algebra. We keep that omega one as a bimodule, so you can multiply from the left and the right. So you can, and of course, bimodule means it's associative. So if you multiply by C onto the differential and then by A, it's the same as multiplying A into the differential and then by C. Now, uh, D is a map from A into omega one. We assume that all of omega one is spanned by things like that. Otherwise, you could just make it smaller. There'd be no point uh, not having that. And then you have the fundamental property of, which is the Leibniz rule. Um, which is which appears like this. Um, things have got a little bit displaced here. Subjectivity is this condition here, and Leibniz rule is this one. Bimodular structure is that one. Now you can extend it to, of course, classically it would be automatic, but we actually have to specify an extension to a, a whole differential graded algebra. That would mean you take the tensor algebra and divide by some ideal of relations, uh, obeying this condition. Now I just want to show you one example. If you have x to be a set, for example, a finite set, we can take all functions on it uh, as our algebra. The classification of differential one forms in according to these axioms just amounts to a graph. So a graph is the same thing, or a directed graph, I should say, is the same thing as a differential structure in the sense uh, where the vertices are x and the arrows are, are allowed differential forms. So omega one is literally spanned by the arrows of the graph. And so, for example, if I if I let e if I if I denote the basis elements of omega one to be e x y labeled by the arrows because they literally are spanned by the arrows, then differential is something which sends a function on the set to a differential, and that differential is just to take a sum over all the arrows with a weight which is the difference of f across the arrow. So these finite differences give you a d, and uh, and this and this obeys these axioms. Then there is there are some there's a there's always a maximal prolongation. There's at least one universal way of extending a given omega one, and then you can have quotients of it. So I mean it's not that you can't, you have to there's not canonical. Um, I mean, there are some canonical quotients, but there's not something which is there are many other possibilities. You have to specify the higher order structure. Now uh, let me just give you an example how this relates to what we were talking about. So if I actually have a, it's actually a Hopf algebra itself. Then um, on, a, on a Hopf algebra, you can actually work with a basis of the invariant one form. So if your differential structure has a left and right translation invariants, then you can always work with left invariant one forms, for example, I call them lambda one. And then these left invariant one forms will form uh, an object in the quantum double or cross module category of A. And using that, I mean, this was implicitly done by Voronovich. He didn't say it quite in the modern way, but Essentially, it was done by Voronovich and in, in 89. And um, using uh, this, you can also take, using this category and the brain, you can also take a natural exterior algebra by taking anti-symmetrization with respect to that. So you had a canonical omega of all degrees. That doesn't concern us right now. What concerns us right now is that um, from the differential cal by covariant calculus, you can write down a certain object which Voronovich called a quantum Lie algebra. Um, uh, but we actually see it now as the as the kernel of a, of a unital braided Lie algebra. So if I give you a, a braided Lie algebra, the type I described before, and if there's additional structure, which I call a unit, I haven't gone into details, but there's a natural notion of a unital braided Lie algebra, then you can take the, then the kernel of the co-unit forms, and this of course is in the abelian category case, uh, forms a, a quantum Lie algebra, which is, which is our case here, forms a quantum, forms a quantum Lie algebra. So, Bradley algebras and quantum algebra are intimately connected. And I'll just show you one example rather than go into all the theory. So we take the Cayley graph of a group. So take X, G be a finite group, or what could actually be any group, and C be an ad stable generating subset, for example, the conjugacy class. That will generate a Cayley graph. That graph corresponds to a differential calculus omega one. 
the Voronovich construction implies automatically omega to all degrees using the quantum double braiding, using the braiding I showed you before uh, in the category of cross G modules. So everything has to get up with what I told you in the first part of the lecture. Now, i focus on an actual example here. So G is going to be S3, the group of permutations of three elements. I'll let C be the, the two cycles. So one, two, two, three, and one, three. Um, now, this is then the Cayley graph. So for example, in a Cayley graph, you step along the generators. So E goes multiplied by U, or from U are multiplied by V. So all, all of these arrows are right translations by elements of C. That's the Cayley graph. Um, now, omega one, now on a Lie group, those of you who know differential geometry know that if you have a Lie group, you it's best to work with the basis of left invariant one forms. We already discussed that here for any Hopf algebra, same thing applies here. But here it's very explicit. The lambda one has a natural basis and these invariant one forms are just the collection of arrows, all the arrows whose step is A for a fixed A. Um, add them all up, and that gives you something which is then, by construction, translation invariant. And, um, and they form a basis. And then if you take the, I didn't tell you what in general, I didn't tell you here, but I, here there's also a natural, I told you that omega one was the vector space spanned by the arrows. There's a natural bimodular structure, which is that F acts from one side by the source of the arrow and on the other side by the target of the arrow. So F acting on E of XY is F of X and F, and F acting from the right on E of XY is F of Y. Um, so that bimodular structure translates into these relations between functions and these left invariant one forms. So what it says is if you move F to the right, it gets right translated by A. Here, RA is the right translation operator of functions on G. And then D now becomes these um, right translation. My identity is the deriv partial derivative in the A direction. Um, that's a certain well-defined function operator on functions on the graph to um, with uh, with this space. And this works also in the infant, in, in the infant dimensional case now. Um, you, but you should probably take C to be finite. You, the group can be infant. Now, um, the exterior algebra I mentioned, uh, the Voronovich one, comes out to be this. So the, one for, the quantum double braiding, I'm referring to the one, way, the one way back over here, this braiding here on, on a conjugacy class inside a group gets this quantum double braiding. When you work that through, um, that gives you these relations. So instead of being anti-symmetric, they obey these triple, ident triple three-term identities which are very similar to the Fermin Kirillov algebra in the theory of cluster algebras um, for the related quantum group of which this would be the bar group, something like that. Uh, D of the differential, uh, I've told you what D is on a, one, on a function, D on a one form is given like that, uh, plus it's cyclic rotations of that. So that's one, that's this general relationship between, on the one hand, you've got a braided Lie algebra associated with this data, that's over here, and that's associated to a quantum Lie algebra, which is associated to the bicovariant calculus. And this is the bicovariant calculus. Now that covers the kind of classical case, classical but non-commutative. What's non-commutative is the, is the functions don't, don't commute with the, func with the one of them. So of course the algebra A here is commutative, but it's still non-commutative geometry. But if you've got something really non-commutative where the algebra itself is non-commutative, you might, for example, have a co-quasi-triangular hop algebra. Now I didn't say what that was, but I told you what a quasi-triangular Hopf algebra was, and this is just the dual notion. So whereas a quasi-triangular Hopf algebra, for those who know uh, about it, says that the Hopf algebra H is co-commutative up to conjugation by R, these co-quasi-triangular ones, they're co-commutative up to a kind of convolution conjugation by R as a functional from A tends to A into the field. So that's all I'm gonna say about this. But things like CQ, SL2, all the duals of quantum groups, the standard quantum groups, standard group coordinate algebras, at least when you're away from roots of unity, um, they are all co-quasi-triangular um, like that. Now the theorem is, is that any sub-coalgebra of A um, gives you on the one hand a bicovariant calculus, um, on the other hand gives you a braided Lie algebra, so they're intimately connected. And here it's not just in one direction, it's a, it's a two-way construction. Um, 
and I, I, I don't really have time to go, in, I mean, it's too off topic for tomorrow's workshop to go into details here. But let me just say that if you want to see more details, it's in this paper, and then most of this appeared also, of this theory appeared in chapter two of, of the yellow book with, with Edwin Beggs. Um, the, uh, for, it's a, a better treatment, if you like, uh, more coherent treatment. Now, but what I want to say here is, is that, um, how do subcardinals arise? Well, just take the matrix elements of an irreducible representation of the Hopf algebra, let's say of UQG. You can view that instead as a co-action of, 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 of A, and the elements that arise in the co-action, the image of, of, of the, of the co-action, um, those are the same thing as the matrix elements in the representation viewed as functions on, on, uh, on, on the group. Um, and so, the, so that, would, that would form a subcoalgebra. So irreps, for example, will give you irreducible subcoalgebras. So an irrep will give you will be a square dimension and will give you a square dimensional calculus. For example, for SL2, the smallest, bico and this gives you all of the bicovariant calculi in, in nice cases. So we have to have a condition on, on R that's kind of sufficiently non-degenerate. The associated killing form is non-degenerate. It's called factorizable. Then that will give, then, that, then the theorem is that it gives you all of the bicovariant calculi, um, irreducible ones. And so the smallest one dimension for quantum SL2 is the one associated to L, to the two-dimensional irreducible representation. So then the sub algebra expands with a set of matrix elements is four-dimensional. So that's a four-dimensional calculus. And that corresponds to a braided Lie algebra, which is dimension four. And this braided Lie algebra has an enveloping algebra and this enveloping algebra projects onto UQG. Just the same picture that we had here, but now works in the quantum case. So UQ, the braid, enveloping algebra of the braided Lie algebra BQSL2 projects onto the onto UQSL2. The theory works exactly. And this guy will now be a, a bi-algebra in the braided category uh, and, um, and gives you really a Lie algebra-like object for every quant for, for all quantum groups of, you know, where you have this, this structure, which basically means all quantum groups of the standard q information type. Um, I mean, there are some details to be worked out for the exceptional groups and things, that, and they, are, they have been worked out in the literature since, since the original work. Um, I mean, I would say not every detail of the calculus, but certainly details to fulfill the theory. Now, um, so that's differential structures. Now, let's do a little bit more. I've still got, uh, got eight minutes. So um, let's do a little bit of differential geometry. I just want to give you a flavor. So up to now, I've been doing things intimately tied with the geometry of quantum groups. But now I want to think much more broadly about non commutative geometry. I mean, I mentioned finite groups, but the finite sets, but I gave you the example, which is actually a group, which was a group S3. Let's go beyond the group case or the hot algebra case and just think of what we can say more generally. So we have an algebra A equipped with a differential calculus in the sense of a differential graded algebra omega. In particular, omega one is a bimodule. Now a metric in this context is going to be um, an element of omega one tends to omega one over A. And now if, if you know Romanian geometry, then you would normally write something like this for the metric as a line element like this. But, what, but what's implicit here is a tensor product, which is kind of hidden in the, in the geometer's notation. Uh, it's a tensor product over the algebra. And this is why they call it tensor calculus, because you're really working with tensor products. Um, and there should be an inverse map the other way. So that's a map like this. And obeying these axioms, these are actually the same axioms I had on my first slide. It says that omega 1 is rigid in the, in the monoidal category of AA and bimodules. Now, this is the starting point of what, what uh, Edwin Beggs and I uh, have studied a lot in the yellow book, which is quantum Riemannian geometry. I won't be doing much of that today. I just want to show you a different application. Um, but one of the key things you need if you're doing Riemannian geometry is once you've got the metric, you need a connection, a levy to beta connection. So what is going to be a connection? A connection, and, and the nice thing is this: all this algebra works over any algebra. You can put here functions on a finite set with a graph. You can put here the algebra of two by two matrices. You can put whatever is your favorite mathematical object. If it has an algebra and you equip it with a differential calculus, you can do, develop this geometry. So uh, a connection, um, normally consider it as, an, as a vector, given a vector field X, you would have an operator on vector fields or on one forms, a covariant derivative. But we'd, we leave the X un, 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 unknown and we just think of the connection like this, where this copy of omega one is waiting to be evaluated against an X, a vector field X. 
So classically, you wouldn't write this. You would think of a connection as a covariant derivative. But if you were to evaluate this against a vector field, then you would have an operator from omega 1 to omega 1, and that, that would be your covariant derivative. Now, the Leibniz properties of covariant derivatives just become abstractly for this map, become this guy. So it says if you multiply by f, you can take it out, um, or you can, you can take it out here, or you can uh, have df tensor omega. So this is the property, characteristic property of connections. Now, because we have a bimodule, we have also the luxury of multiplying from the right. I mean, classically, they'd be the same, and you wouldn't even think about it. But in non-commutative geometry, they could be different. And so if you have to let from the other side, this bit, you would expect, f, on the one hand, f to come out, no problem. You'd also have to have a bit, which is df, f omega tensor df. But the thing is, is that to be consistent, it's the left-hand output of this, which is going to be where you evaluate your vector field. And it's that left-hand output that has to couple to the dx, to the df. So you can't, you can't just write omega tensor df. You've got to have some kind of map, a bimodule map from omega 1 tensor omega 1, which classically would be the flip map. So you need some kind of map like this, which classically would just put the df in the first position. And then this would become the usual Leibniz rule in the classical case. So when you have a connection which admits this sigma, we call that a bimodule connection. And um, this, what, this, this uh, idea was first, in, go, go, well, I think the history of it really goes back to Peter Micho, um, in Vienna and, uh, and uh, Michel dubois Violette. Um, and they sort of, uh, the, the point is that the sigma is not additional structure. It's just that some connections, because sigma is defined by this equation. So if it exists, sigma is uniquely defined by this. So it's just that some connections, you just have a left covariant derivative, but some left covariant derivatives admit this, this right-handed structure. And we call those bimodule covariant derivatives. Now that's a subclass and they have beautiful properties. The category of bimodule covariant derivatives is a monoidal category. You can tensor product them. In particular, if I've got a connection on omega one, then I get a tensor product one on omega one tensor omega one. And the way it works here is if omega and eta are in omega one, then I can take, I can act on one copy and I can act on the other copy. I've shown it in this diagram. You act on one copy or I can act on the other copy, but then I need the braiding to take it through to the right position to where I would evaluate against a vector field on the far left. So that's the condition. So that's how naturally how a connection extends to tensor products. Then you could, therefore, you know how NAB acts on G on a, on a metric. And you can define a leverage of either connection as something where NAB G is zero and the torsion is zero. The torsion is itself another interesting story. It's the, it's the comparison of the two ways to go from omega one to omega two, namely directly via D or via NABLA into omega one tensor omega one and then by wedge. So that's the meaning of the torsion vanishing is that these two are equal. There's a curvature defined by this diagram. I won't say too, too much about it because this topic is not really going to be about, about that. It's really about Young-Baxter equations. So what um, in the last two minutes, I just want to say um, you, one of the questions Edwin and I asked back in 2011 was when does the sigma arising in this way from non-commutative geometry, when does it obey the braid relations? Um, and the answer is quite often. So for example, for S3, we found seven one-parameter families. Um, and then among those seven, I think uh, you can find two, which are featuring in, in my new paper with, uh, which I'll tell you about next in the last minute, uh, which are precisely two which are flat and torsion-free. And they're labeled by a root of unity, a non-trivial root of unity. And then the braiding looks like this. As you can see, it's non-trivial. There are three terms for every of these transpositions. It obeys the braid relations, has quite interesting eigenvalues and things. Um, and then if you look for quantum SL2 with its 3D calculus, that admits five one parameter, um, fam one, one five parameter family and two three parameter families. So the answer is plenty of times. Now, what we didn't have an answer to back in the day was why would you care? Why would you want the braiding to obey? The, why would you want sigma to obey the braid relations? And so that's what I'm going to end with, is this work that I'm just writing up now with my student, um, Francisco uh, castella -Simual. Simual. Um, The classic, uh, just, just in one minute, the classical jet bundle on a manifold is a bundle uh, with, which, which includes all the high derivatives. So it, it, every, every function can be prolonged to its, the function, its differentials, its second differentials, et cetera. And so we would like to have something like that also over, 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 over a bundle. Um, and so you can do that for any differential algebra. So if I'm given a differential algebra and a torsion-free connection, I can take J1 to be A plus omega 1 and take a, J2 to be A plus omega 1 plus a symmetric part. This is the kernel of the wedge product. 
of, uh, of omega-1 tensor omega-1. And then I define the product, um, th these we one maps make uh, J1 into a, into an, into a, a bimodule, and these two maps make J2 into a, into a bimodule. And then, uh, and then this maps J become bimodule maps. So the whole theory works. And this gadget two, two sigma is on the next slide. I'm going to end uh, very soon, Tom. <laughs> so, um, the, uh, so this, the two is the braiding of two. And just to cut a long story short, it, it is just the braiding plus the identity plus a braiding, similar to one plus Q in quantum geometry. And then similarly for sigma three, and, uh, the symmetric part is the joint kernel. And I define three sigma to be this symmetrization, these, these operators here. And then the, this identity is equivalent to the yang baxter or braid relations. And the theorem is that the whole theory works for J3, which is now built on functions, first derivative, second derivative, symmetric derivative, third symmetric derivative, with J3 given like this in terms of J2. And these are the three products. And the three products involve the two products and these other, these three integer, braided integer maps. And the whole theory works provided um, Nabla is torsion free, flat, wedge compatible, extendable, Leibniz compatible, and obeys the braid relations. And these are the four identities here. Well, torsion free and braiding I've defined for you earlier in the talk. Wedge compatible says basically that you can drag this through. And extendable extends that you can drag this, drag this through. Braid relations, you know, these are the braid relations. Um, I hope you know. Um, and this is a new one, which is we call Leibniz compatible. It ensures that this Leibniz rule holds. If you think about it, this is what you would hope in classical geometry, but you'd expect a three here, not, not a braided three. So the bottom line is, is this braided diagram picture, these are braided, though there's not, there is a braided category as soon as you've got omega one with a braiding sigma. This says that there is a braided category generated by omega one. Uh, and in this braided category, we have um, natural constructions going on, which are needed for the jet bundle theory to work. Okay, so I'm going to stop there. I've shown you, I hope that uh, we have categorical concepts which are more general than sets, but I put, try to put that in a bigger context. And then I've showed you that the theory is still alive and well in, in, in many forms, including in the literature on braided categories and two categories, which I haven't talked about, and now in non-commutative geometry. Okay, and this work with Francisco will, it will, is in progress. Okay, thank you very much, Tom.